Hi out there. <laughs> the show you're listening to is called Let's Talk. My name is Tank Nelson. I guess I'm your host, your talker, or whatever. Uh, we don't have call-ins. We don't have a co-host. So it'll be me talking to you. I hope you find it fun. I hope you find it interesting. I, well, and I hope you stay tuned. Uh, if you want to get in touch with us, well, if you want to get in touch with me, uh, it's Tank Nelson, one word, at earthlink.net. Um, leave the message. I'll get it. Uh, we can talk on the net. We can talk any way you want to. Um, I can talk to you over the radio. Whatever, whatever comes up, it'll be interesting and hopefully it'll be fun. Now the station uh, is 1340, as you know. It's kyns uh, dot com. So you can get in touch by by email here. You can call the station. In fact, I just I, I, I should know the receptionist's name, but I just left her a card that gives her the phone number, my phone number. So if you wish to get in touch, you can get in touch. That's that's the way that is. Now, the idea of the show, I mean, if you've heard, this will be the fifth show. The idea of the show is all based on talking. It's, it's, a, it's a pretty simple premise, simple fun. Uh, I'm, a new, I'm, a new, I'm a beginner. I'm new at this. Um, and, and in that vein, I wanna listen, I'm going to assume that you heard the fourth show. At the end of the fourth show, I was talking about being a longshoreman. Which I did. That's what I did most of my life. I started back in the 50s, and I worked all 50s, 60s, 80s. Uh, retired 11 years ago. Talking about a longshoreman, also talking about writing a book, which I just completed after a three-year shot. I finished a biography. Well, what the 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 thing that interested me there was that a very famous guy, a very talented guy. Uh, also was a longshoreman and worked at the same time I was working. When I was working the L.A. docks, Eric Hoffer was working the San Francisco docks. And Eric, I'm going to call him Eric. He's dead. I can call him Eric if I want to. Eric is really one of the famous longshoremen because, well, he was a writer. He wrote while he worked, uh, and he won a Pulitzer. I mean, that's pretty good stuff. Uh, this The conversation last week was based on my amusement that uh, because we're both longshoremen, we've worked at the same time, different harbors, but same same union, same things. Both knew Harry Bridges, no, you know that that business. We were brothers, shoulder to shoulder, kind of speak. We were on the same strikes. We were got the same raises, uh, worked the same ships. Both wrote books. He wrote more than I did. He won a Pulitzer. But reading Eric Hoffer, well, actually reading Eric Hoffer is one of the reasons I'm here. I'm a, a Democrat. I'm a liberal. You know, I'm, I'm against the death penalty. I'm for choice. Uh, but Hoffer opens your mind. Uh, he, lets you, he lets you think. I mean, he's, he's really telling you what he thinks, which, if, and of course, if, he's a, if somebody's a good thinker and they tell you what they think, it's a great pleasure. So I had, I had great pleasure in reading Eric Hoffer, and he helped solidify what I already believed. Now, that's a, that's a big step, a big, <laughs> big step to solidify what you already believe. Uh, we're on, you know, we're on Air America. I mean, we're on Progressive Radio, Air America, this station. Uh, if you listen to it, and this happens, I've talked to a lot of people. People listen to it all through the week. I mean, there are, um, there are lots of people in, in the San Luis Obispo and surrounding areas that their station, when they get in their car or whatever, and, they, and they're going down the road or at home, they turn on 1340. I do it. That's what I do. Uh, I'm, I'm, interested in, I'm interested in the opinions. I'm interested in the knowledge. And as much as anything, it's very exciting. Very exciting business to be involved in something that I'm not, I mean, I, I, I'd be very quick to tell you. I'm not important, but the idea of this station, what it represents, the idea of democracy, the idea of the people by your vote being in control of what takes place in the country, this is all really big stuff. Now, I would stay right in this vein for the rest of this show, <laughs> but uh, there's a lot more in the world. Um, the recently, I, I'm going I'm to shift. I, I can do this. I'm, a, I'm an amateur. I can do whatever I want in, the, on, on, for the, in this period of time. I'm going to shift shift gears. Prairie Home Companion, playing at the Palm. 
I hope it's still playing when you hear this. Uh, we sat in the back. It was full. It was, but we were, oh, in fact, there was a uh, letter. I haven't seen this before. I don't believe. Maybe I have. But letter to the editor in the Tribune today about the movie. Letter to the editor about the movie. I thought that was wonderful. Well, actually, it was two, edit- two letters. One wasn't complimentary. The other one was. And that's now, of course, the world's like that. There's different opinion. But Prairie Home Companion, the movie. And, of course, I, you know, I was a little serious back there about politics and about uh, writing and that. Well, let's let, let that go aside. Let's go on to Prairie Home Companion. Delightful, delightful movie. I mean, the Palm isn't very, the, you know, there's not a lot of seats in each theater in the Palm. And this place was jam-packed. We were lucky to get it. I like to sit in the back. We were lucky to get We went early. We had to wait. You know, you get there early, you have to wait. We waited 20 minutes for it to start. Uh, I mean, Robert Altman, and I, I'm not, I mean, I love MASH, the, the original movie, but he's made a couple of movies in between that leave me scratching my head. But this one, this 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 movie, Prairie Home Companion, and there are so many interesting things that take place, so much fun. But another thing, and one of the reasons I really liked it, some of it was very inside. Now, I've worked in television a little bit. I've worked in radio a little bit. I uh, love show business all my life. So, yeah, and I've read about a lot about it. So I'm a little inside, and it was just a joy. Sitting there in the palm, there was, and I'm, I'm not, this is just the way it happened. I'm not saying it's good or bad. But there was a couple times in Prairie Home Companion where I fell apart laughing, and I realized nobody else was laughing. No, that's, <laughs> I mean, I'm sure that's happened to many people. But I knew it was funny, and the rest of the audience didn't know it was funny because, again, a little showbiz inside. Now, that beside, I'm I'm telling you upright. You, if if you don't see it at the theater, uh, and I hope they hold it over long enough that everybody can go see it. I hope they put it in a bigger theater so you have more room to go see it. It is absolutely charming. It's and it's and it's hilariously funny. Well, from that, and in show business, and being a little inside, here is, uh, well, I I would say this this is this is, I, I like a lot of stuff. I like reading. Uh, last week I talked about Colless Bookstore and how much I like going there. And I love, talked about an author I like, uh, that type of thing. So I like reading. Uh, I like cooking. I'm, I'm, I do all the cooking at my house. Um, I like traveling. I like, there's a lot. I mean, well, there's a lot to like. I mean, <laughs> there's uh, one, one, one of the things about, well, one of the things about belonging to a, a strong union especially one that came up through the hard times. And certainly longshoring was like that. I, could, I mean, I could tell you the history of longshoremen and bring you to tears at part of it. And I came up through it, not necessarily as a longshoreman. Well, I was a longshoreman when I was 18 years old, but through the early strikes where there's not enough to eat, that kind of, that, there, there were those conversations. But we're, again, we're going to put that aside. I just, I just drift back and forth in my thoughts because I was thinking of Prairie Home Companion and how long it's been around. That put me back in the times. But I'm going to, again, I'm going to shift right here because there's there's a, an interesting bit of life. And it's a chance, well, I mean, you. I wish you could call in and I wish we could talk over, I, I wish we were sitting at some cafe talking over coffee. So when I said something, you could say, well, wait a minute, what about this? I would love to have that situation. And eventually, I, I said, I hope we'll have call-ins and that situation will exist. But here is just a, the, here's the, just a plain story. It's 19... 19- 75. I'm living in Utah. Man, there are lots of stories about why I'm living in Utah. Remember, born and raised in San Pedro, and I'm a longshoreman. And uh, commuting from Utah to Los Angeles Harbor is a bit of a commute, so I'm not longshoring at the time. But I'm living there. Uh, I was in a couple businesses, some kind of successful, others tragically unsuccessful. In this case, I am broke. I'm thinking about going, I'm thinking about leaving Utah going back to the L.A. waterfront, picking it up again and making a living and, and getting, getting caught up. That's what I'm thinking about. But on this day, uh, I basically broke. And I, I need enough money to continue on. Well, I have a friend, a very good, dear friend named Gene Belknap. Dar- wonderful guy. An accountant, a straight shooter, you know, good Mormon, blah, blah, all that stuff. I went to his office, and really what I'm after is to borrow. Now, it doesn't sound like a lot of money today, and it wouldn't be a lot of money to me today, but it was then. I wanted to borrow $20. Went to his office, walked in. Gene looks at me, smiles, and, you know, I mean, we know each other well. He could, he could read the body language. He knew that I needed to borrow money. 
And he says, uh, listen, do you need $20? <laughs> I laughed because we had that kind of uh, relay. You could see that you could see the twinkle in his eyes that he knew the story. And I said, yeah. He said, well, I'll tell you what. Tell me a story. Now, this is what we used to do. And I, and I would tell like a joke or something, just fooling around. It was just it just it was just two guys. And we go to lunch together and we go. The first thing we sat down at lunch ever. And he would be buying. He'd say, tell me a story. And because he just, you know, it was just that that way it was. Well, anyway, so I sat down. Well, I had a story on my mind. And so I told it to him. Now, I'm, I'm a big movie fan, so I see everything in the form of a movie. So I started telling him. Now, this name of the story is Vladimir Glumak. That's, the, that's the, the main guy in the story. I sit down and I tell him the story. Now, once I start, as you, uh, you're listening to this radio, you know that I ramble on. Once I start telling the story... It's like nobody else is there. I'm into the story. I can see the characters. I can see the, the male lead, the female lead, the peripheral characters. I, I hear the dialogue. I mean, I'm telling him the story, and, I'm, and, I'm, and I look up, and I'm, now I'm reading his body language. He is leaning forward in his chair. That's a very good sign when you're telling the story, that they lean forward. They also, their eyes don't shift off you, and they don't yawn. All good signs. Anyway, I wrap up the story, and Gene says, he says, Tank, that's a heck of a story. <laughs> And I said, well, thank you. He gives me the 20. And I'm just going out there. He says, can you come back tomorrow? And I, and I hesitate. He says, well, listen, I'll, I'll lend you another 20. Now, this all money is to be paid back. And when I go back to Longshore, I make good money. And I've always, you know, I always pay him back. So I said, yeah. Well, now, of course, you know, gas in those days, $1.25 a gallon and all that. So, yeah, I'll come back. I come back the next day. Walk into us. He got a nice office, you know, big, big desk, big chair, two, two chairs out front, guest chairs out front. Well, in one of the guest chairs, this big leather chair, sits this fellow. And he introduced me to the guy. Richard Brown is his name. Hell, Richard, Tank, Gene, you know, we, went, we did that. Gene says to me, tell Richard the story. Now, how naive I am, I didn't even know what he's talking I didn't know what story he's talking about. I says, what story? He says, the one from yesterday about Vladimir. I says, oh, yeah. Well, of course, I rehearsed it yesterday. I mean, I, I didn't know what story meant. I looked at Richard. I says, you got, a, you got time? He says, I got time. So... I started telling the story of Vladimir Glumak. Now, I would I would tell you, I'm not going to tell you the whole story because it takes a while. But I say it's a good story. It's interesting. It's provocative. It's about an athlete. It's about uh, it was about about the Olympics. And my idea was it'd be perfect for a TV movie prior to the Olympics. Richard listens, listens, listens. Get all done. Let's say it takes 20 minutes to tell. I was pitching the story actually. I mean, I I didn't know I was doing that, but I. Whenever I start telling the story, I'm really pitching the story. Get all done. He says, I'd like to option that. I mean, I'd, actually, I, I'll tell you seriously, I'm not sure if I knew what an option meant. I said, what do you mean? He says, well, I'd like to option the story. How long will it take to get it done? Now, you know, this is like asking a dumb kid about homework. I said, oh, well, I could, you know. And he says, I'll give you $2,000 for the option. Now, remember, $20 was a lot of money. This guy just offered me $2,000, and I'm broke. I have to go back to L.A. to go to work. I have no money. He's offered me two grand. I said, well, he said, I'll give you 300 now. He reached in his wallet and gives me three $100 bills. Now, not only did I smile, but I thought my wife was really going to smile because she was, you know, she, every day she's worried about what's going to happen. Anyway, I take the 300 and, I, and, he, and he asked me time. I guess it was because of the three. I, I told him three weeks. He says, fine, when you get it done, I'll give you the rest of the money. Well, three weeks stretched into six weeks. I'm in writer's block. Yellow pad, big pen. I mean, I didn't even write the title. Vladimir Glumak. I didn't even write the title down. One day I get a call and he says, if it's not done by Monday, the deal is off. Keep the 300, no 1700. Well, I really need the money now. I went into, I, I, I told him it would be done. This is a Friday. I told him it would be done. I went home, and I actually watched television. I watched Johnny Carson Friday night. Didn't write a word. And I thought, well, I'm going to blow the 1700. I, it was hard to tell you how this was all feeling. The next morning I got up. Now, who knows why people do what they do? I told my wife, my darling wife, Nola, I says, look it, leave me alone. I'll be in the bed. We didn't have a big house. I had a small house. I'll be in the bedroom. Went in the bedroom, sat on the bed, yellow pad, big pen started writing Vladimir Glumak. Now, the only clue I had to how a screenplay is to be written is I had a copy of Bloody, Sun Bloody Sunday, Sunday, Bloody Sunday that was in script form. And I looked at that and I says, well, okay, I guess it's got to be like this. I wrote Vladimir Glumak that day for nine and a half hours, nonstop. Didn't eat, didn't stop, 
nine and a half hours. At the end, my hand was so warped and crooked that I couldn't move it. Went in a hot tub, laid in the tub for a couple, kept adding hot water, laid in there for a couple of hours. Not for my body, well, it hurt too, but my, to get my hand straightened out. The next day, Sunday, I got up, told her again, I'll be in the bedroom. Went in the bedroom and wrote for about seven hours. Couldn't move my hand at the end. I mean, at the end, I was absolutely paralyzed. My Up to my elbow, it was, it was like paralyzed. I was done. Finished up, went up to Jean's office on that Monday morning, walked in. There was a secretary, darling secretary. I love secretaries. Walked in, and I forget her name, but I said, listen, I need you to type this for me. I'm sure it'd be all right with Jean. I don't know if it was all right or not. I said, I, I would, and, you know, people in those days, I think they would make, you know, she was probably making 6 $8 an hour. I said, I'll give you $20 for typing it. Well, she had one of those select things with the ball on it that, you know, that you can type like mad. And I handed her the thing. And I, I actually I went out and got a cup of coffee and a donut and sat out somewhere and read the paper. I came back and she was going along like fury. And then she stopped. And she says, I can't read this now. Well, the last five or six pages, I told you how my hand was. It was really, it looked like some chicken had watched across the paper. So I said, I'll read it to you. So I sat down and I, I was even editing and changing the dialogue as I was reading to her. And she was, you know, dutifully sitting there typing away. Gets it all done, and I'm she. I was just, just darling. She picks it up, straightens it up, goes over to the thing with punches holes in it, punches the three holes, gets the blue folder, puts those brass things up, closes it down, puts it on. Then she went to her thing and she typed out the title, Vladimir Glumak. I'm sitting there looking at a blue folder with it. There was only, I think it was 68 pages. I didn't know how long a screenplay should be, but I'm looking at it and it says Vladimir Glumak by Tank Nelson. I, I mean, I don't, I don't know if I would even care if he gave me the 1700 I was so happy that it was done. It was like, you know, Sisyphus and the rock. I had just thrown the rock off. Well, I'm, I'm waiting. In comes Gene. He says, how you doing? I said, I'm fine. He says, uh, you know, Richard will be here soon. We waited. Richard came in. Now, I'm, I'm waiting for a read, and, a, and I'm waiting to, you know, I don't know what's going to happen. He picks it up. He looks at the front. He opens the first page. He actually thumbed the pages, just like you would do any, like you're in a bookstore. You just kind of, you know, there's just thumb the pages. He says, thank you, Tank. And he handed me $1,700. Now, again, I can't tell you how thrilled. You know, it'd be $20 was a lot of money, $300 was a lot of money, $1,700 was a fortune. I mean, those days, those times. Anyway, I get the $1,700. Well, it turns out that Richard... He'd produce some big stuff, uh, that uh, the 76 thing with the uh, world uh, across America, whatever it was. But he knows Fred, I was going to give you his name, Fred uh, Silverman. Fred Silverman at NBC is the president of NBC, and Richard knows him well. So I'm thinking, my goodness, he has my script in his hand. He knows this guy that runs NBC. I mean, I had... I had you know, twinkles in my eyes and stars flashing and I, my feet weren't on the ground. It was, I mean, I can't tell you how exciting it was. Anyway, he takes a script. I've got a $1,700 and he is off to Los Angeles. Goes to Los Angeles. Now I'm, you know, I'm waiting for the phone to ring that the world to change. It was just glorious. Well, at the same time, this is life. Now this is, the <laughs> this is life. At the same time, this is going on in Los Angeles. Now, why Silverman was in Los Angeles instead of New York, but I guess it's because he was the producer and not the head of the studio. I mean, he's the head of the studio, but not in New York where the big guys are. But Silverman was behind a show. And now, you're probably not old enough to remember this, but maybe you are. He produced a show called The Big Train. Most, it was like Gone with the Wind or all those shows. The most money ever spent on a movie, uh, a TV show. Big Train. It played, the first night it played, I think it ran two hours. It's supposed to be a serious drama, as I remember it, and it just bombed terribly. I mean, it went right. The reviewers laughed at it. They said, you are nuts. Why would you do this? Why would you spend this money? Well, the second episode came out, and it bombed as big. And, I mean, I saw it, too, and I realized, I don't know why they did it. I mean, I'm, I'm an amateur out here, and I realized they'd done the, you know, this was really crazy. Well, what happens is Silverman gets fired. Silverman gets the president that my contact NBC going to make this wonderful television movie, uh, you know, pre-Olympics is going to be a that, 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 futures, whatever, all these, you know, everything was going to go just Jake and it's all gone. My script is sitting on a shelf at NBC. I make, I find out that it isn't going to, you know, it's not, I'm calling, I mean, I'm calling, <laughs> try to get a hold of Silverman, try to get a hold of anybody and it's over. Now, that's show business. We were just talking earlier about a, a movie that's a terrific movie, and, and I've talked a couple weeks ago about how tough it is to get a movie made. 
And this is an incident that took place in Utah. Uh, we're talking about over 30 years ago, and it still haunts me. I mean, I'm not unhappy. I mean, it was it was a glorious experience. It was a fantastic experience. It was just fun on top of fun on top of fun. It's uh, and it, well, here I am on Air America 30 years later, telling you a story. So something came out of it. I mean, something. Came, and now, oh, there's a sidelight to the story. That I, you know, I get talking. I easily went by the sidelight to the story. Vladimir Glumak is about a Russian guy that's altered by their scientists to be the world's fastest runner. He can run a nine point, I think it was 9.300 meters anytime he wishes. Anytime he wishes. Now, that would be world's record. That whatever those guys, those guys just recently ran for the fastest man in the world. I forget what their time was. I think it's in the 9.7s or 9.8s. In my story, Vladimir Glumak can run a 9.300 meters anytime he wants to. And it's all about the Olympics, and it's all about prestige, and it's all about the government, the power, and the public relations of all this. I mean, that's what this, this was all involved in that story. Now, I'm, I'm chagrined that it goes under, and I'm, this, um, and I'm thinking, you know, I'm going to get it to somebody else. All the things that screenwriters might think they're going to do. As all this is happening, now, this, let's say some time goes by. A movie comes out called Golden Girls with Susan Anton. I think that's how you pronounce her, Anton. Big, tall, beautiful, blonde lady. Uh, Anyway, she was going to be the new star and all that. But this movie comes out called Golden Girl. Well, it's almost the same story. Not not exactly. There was more one way or more. But it is the same concept. The movie comes out. plays. It's a theatrical movie. I'm thinking TV. My mind was, I was thinking TV. This is a theatrical movie. And it bombs. Uh, well, you know, they sold my story. You know, whatever. Well, then I was, you know, I was, as all people, I was curious and wondering. and well, Then I realized that Golden Girl came from a book. I went to the library, looked it up. <laughs> sure enough, the copyright in Golden Girl is before I ever invented Vladimir Glumak. Now, I didn't know about the story. I didn't know that the story, of course, all, all writers start on top of other writers. I mean, that's what we, every, everything, every talkers, writers, thinkers are all standing on the shoulders of giants because somebody did it before us. But here was this book that had a, uh, a <laughs> <laughs> the copyright before I ever thought of Vladimir Glumak. So the guy that wrote Golden Girls was way ahead of me. I didn't know it. I, I wrote my script based on a, an idea. Now it's still, there are still parts of Vladimir Glumak that could transition into another book uh, or another screenplay or another thing. But uh, I, I shifted off into show business. Um, it's what I do. I, 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 shift, I shift ideas pretty quickly. But I also, it's... Well, I'm I'm the guy here talking to you. I'm you know I'm, if you if you turn at 7:34 to this station on Saturday night, you're going to hear me talking. Uh, it's called it's called Let's Talk. You're going to hear me talking, and you'll find out. I hope you'll well I hope you'll find it interesting. I hope you'll find it fun. Um, all the things that anybody talking to you would like, I would like. Um, the subject matter, as we you've just heard, if you listen to this whole show, you heard it. You heard that uh, we went we were political for a while. We were talking about philosophy for a while. Uh, we were talking about a little history, a little of that. And then we got into, a, well, <laughs> kind of a long story. But what, it, what the nice part is, is, well, it's a one-way street right here. You get to know me. Uh, and I hope you find it, you know, I hope you find it interesting. When we get to uh, guests, which should be in a couple of weeks, we get to guests It'll probably be even get more interesting because the questions will come off the cuff. They'll just pop out. Then you really, you know, then the truth really comes out of people when they have to answer quickly. I mean, that's when truth comes forward. And, I, you know, I hope I'm, I, when this time comes, I'll be truthful, be interesting, and be, uh, I don't know about provocative, but we're certainly going to try. Anyway, we're on, you know, we're on 1340. You can get us at uh, the dot coms. You, I gave you the tank Nelson at earthlink.com. You can call the station anytime you want. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, it's it's a pleasure being on the air with you. I don't know where you are at uh, this time of the night, but I whatever you're doing, whatever you're doing, uh, I have a I have well I sign all my letters all all the and I I write a lot for some reason, but all my stuff goes out with a I, I sketch a tank uh, that long story how that came up, but uh, above the tank it always says the same thing. It says laugh lots. I've been around 73 years. And I truly, truly believe that laughter is one of the great gifts life has for us. And to have it, well, you, all you, in, in a way, all you have to do is believe it. I hope you have a good time. I hope you'll be here next week. I'll see you then.